When we begin to look at God's ways, God's character, God's love, God's plans, God's government, we begin to realize that God, the whole topic of God is enormous. And this explains to a great extent the enormity of the subject, explains to a great extent why there's so much confusion on the topic. Does, does, does that make sense to you? If you only have, and, and if you only focus on three pages out of the Bible, and from that you derive your total theology, your, your, your theology is grossly inadequate. Now, I'm, I'm using that to, you know, to ex, that extreme to make the point. Reconciling all that the Bible says about Jesus is not for the faint of heart. It is a lot of work. And it is difficult. And it requires a great deal of discipline to keep at it to do so. It's like learning to play the piano or any other instrument or accomplish anything that is significantly difficult. At first, it's all a mess. It takes a while to sort it out. And do you know that if you've been a Christian, and if you have attended church for 20 years, you have spent the same amount of time in the pews that it would take for you to go to college and get a master's degree. Now let me ask you, in which case have you learned more? Do we have a problem here? We live in such a fast-paced world where everything is right here, right now, get this, do that, go here, be there, that, that taking time and, and managing the discipline to practice your Bible for one hour a day, did I say piano? No, I said Bible. Practicing your Bible one hour a day, it's hard to get it in. It truly is. Every day, that's right. So if you're going to get a good picture of Jesus, you've got to start in Genesis, and you've got to go all the way through to Revelation. And that is a work of a lifetime. I've been back and forth many times and you know the Bible to me is still a new book. Every time I get in there I find things that I've never before considered until I open my old Bible and there are my old notes. I'm forgetting more now than I can remember. I'd like to show you a statement from Paul. Paul had a certain amount of understanding which God gave him about coming events. And God showed him Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. Je the Lord showed Paul him serving behind the veil. What Paul didn't know was the timing. The bones have not been pulled out of Daniel yet. He didn't know anything about 1844. What Paul saw was truth. What Paul thought about it with respect to time is wrong. That's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? It was for me at first. And this is one point that Luther and I argued about for two years. <laughs> Until we began to see the bones. It, and what apocalyptic prophecy does is that it, it puts everything the prophets of old was, was shown 
in its proper place in God's plan. It doesn't diminish their contributions at all. We marvel at what God revealed to them. They just couldn't know where it all went and how it went together. It wasn't the appointed time. The time of the end. The book of Daniel is sealed up. The roots, the bones are buried until the appointed time of the end. One other thing I'd like to say about, two things I'd like to say about the chart you're looking at. I know a lot of Christians just despise charts. Oh, I hear it all the time. Not another chart. I hate charts. <laughs> and I say to them, okay, let's discuss the relationship between the fifth seal and the sixth trumpet without any paper. Try that sometime and see what happens. Let's, let's suppose you're a math teacher. And let's suppose we're going to do a little quadratic equation right here with no paper. How far are we going? <laughs> of course not. People who don't like charts uh, have a problem. I'm not sure that's a problem I can fix. So I wish them well and leave them to their own devices. But I'd like to say about this particular chart... It, it strikes me with incredible interest that 15 minutes after the visions had been given to John in A.D. 95, this chart could have been drawn. Everything would have been just like you see it there. 15 minutes after the vision, I would give John time to get a new ink bottle and uh, get out his crayons and make the chart. Because the rules that God put in Daniel, the rules that were buried to bring out the bones, it was all there. 600 years earlier. 550 years earlier. Whatever. 15 minutes after the visions of Revelation were completed, that chart could have been drawn. That is interesting to me. And I might add, you have the, the good fortune of seeing the world's largest apocalyptic chart. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about God's coming wrath. And... And then, uh, after this evening, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the timing. God's way of... Uh, um, Jets, would you look out that window there for a minute and see if there's a problem? It's a drill. Okay. I saw a lot of smoke, and I didn't know... Oh, they're doing, they're doing a fire drill? Oh, power tools. Barbie, oh, they're grilling, Larry. Barbecue, ah, okay. Uh, you know, um... One, I had, a, I had a, 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 pa a pastor one time, years, several years ago, and he said, uh, you know what's wrong with you, Larry? <laughs> and I said, where do you want to start? <laughs> he said, no, he said, he said, you know, he said, you have some pretty good ideas every now and then. But he said, the problem with you is that rather than calmly discussing the possibility of fire, you come busting through the door yelling fire. <laughs> and he said, that's the problem I have with you. You're just an alarmist. You're just an alarmist. You're getting the saints all revved up for no reason. I said, well, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Somebody's got to ring the bell. Um... 
Look at the scripture, Colossians 3, 5. Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he identified some of the problems with the earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God is coming. I believe, for reasons beyond the, the scope of our discussion right now, I believe that God's patience with earth came to an end in 1994. I believe that um, his patience ran out and the seven angels were given the seven trumpets and they went to the four corners of the earth ready to induce a lot of harm. And notice what the Bible says here in, in Revelation 7. I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he called out in a loud voice to the four angels. Notice the past perfect tense. Who had been given power to hurt, harm, destroy the land and the sea. And he said, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. I don't have to tell this group, I know that you all understand that the land and the sea and the trees are all harmed in the first three trumpets. We're speaking quite literally here. And there is this relationship between the things that are literal and the things that are spiritual. And so John is shown that the time has come. Look, in Revelation 8.1, as a, as, a, as a Bible engineer, you're forced into a difficult moment right here in Revelation 8.1. You've got to take a nail and a hammer and you've got to go along somewhere in history or into the future and you've got to drive the nail down. This is a punctiliar moment. And when I was in the 80s working on this and trying to figure this out and get this going, I had a big sheet of paper about 12 feet long on the wall in my study. And... I would draw up these lines and I'd get the markers and I'd go put things around and move them around trying to get these things all to fit together. And so I learned early that when you see a punctiliar event, you've got to nail it down, pun intended. So get your nail and your hammer and go looking along somewhere. This thing has got to go. Where do you put it? And so Revelation 8.1 says, when he opened the seven, excuse me, Revelation 8.2, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. All right, where are the seven angels given seven trumpets? It doesn't say in the Bible where that is. So how do I find a, a place on the timeline to put that? Well, I concluded after reading the rest of Revelation 8, well, They've got to be given the seven trumpets before they can sound them. <laughs> yeah, okay. That was a brilliant deduction. <laughs> and then when I understood what the trumpets would be, wrath. I remember the day I was sitting in my study looking at this, and it dawned on me, wow, this is an asteroid. Second trumpet. First trumpet, wow, this is a meteoric firestorm. Wow. Looking at the third trumpet, this is a huge asteroid that hits the sea and sinks the ships and kills a third of the sea creatures. Whoa. God's going to do this? Are, are these what the judgments are? This was about 19... Oh... 86, 87, uh, 86, 
And as I pondered over it and I thought about it, I said, aha, these seven trumpets are like the seven bowls, except these have mercy mixed in and these don't. So it must be that the great tribulation consists of 14 judgments. Seven first plagues, seven last plagues. Now, where does that thing go? And I'm back to looking to nail this down. Well, I didn't understand the Jubilee calendar at this time. And so, I, I, you know... I've, I've had pastors tell me that Revelation 8, 2, that when the seven angels who stand before God and were given the seven trumpets, I've had pastors tell me that this happened at the time of Noah's flood. Noah's flood? And so the four angels have been waiting since Noah's flood? The first four trumpets have been waiting since Noah's flood? No. No. Daniel Daniel 8:19 tells me that the time of wrath concerns the appointed time of the end. Where is this appointed time? I learned something else looking around in the boneyard of Daniel. I believed at the time I was searching, I was convinced that the fifth trumpet described the physical appearing of the devil. And here's... In my elementary way of thinking about it in those days, how this was my reasoning. I thought that at a point in time, God's patience with earth would run out. Um, let me back up for just a minute and, and, and tell you how this evolved. And it'll maybe help you help someone else evolve. I know you have already evolved. But, but when you're working with others and trying to encourage others, uh, you need to remember the shoes they're standing in and the paradigm that they have, and it's not like yours. So I'm sharing these things so that you can use them maybe to help someone else take the next step in trying to get to the story. It's a big, huge story. You know the parable of the ten virgins? And they all went out to meet the bridegroom, and then the Bible says they all, A-L-L, -L, they all went to sleep. And that puzzled me. If the virgins represent the Christian faith, the Christian church, they, that means that no one is anticipating what's going to happen. They all go out expecting Jesus to come, but he tarries a long time, and they go to sleep. Look up that word, Paul. See if that's there. <laughs> now, at midnight, the Bible says, there was a cry. And what is the cry? It's an announcement. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go you out to meet him. And then you know the story, how the five foolish were found inadequate and could not get back and get in the door and they, Jesus said and this is so cool to me and yet it was so serious to me Jesus what does Jesus say to the foolish virgins I never knew you That hit me. These are people who say, I have a relationship with Christ. I'm a virgin. I'm part of the body of Christ. I went out to meet the bridegroom. And what does Jesus say to them? 
Whoa. What did Jesus say to me? I had a dream one night. I never dream unless I eat pizza late. <laughs> and I'm sure this was a, one of those dreams that was caused by bad pizza. But I dreamed J Jesus was coming. And I dreamed that, that the clouds uh, were, were just billowing and, and the angels, millions of angels flying around. And I looked around and I saw people leaving the earth, you know, jumping up in the air and meeting the Lord. And I woke up trying to jump out of the bed. <laughs> the problem was in the dream, I would jump up but come back down. That's a little disappointing. Oh. That was, a, when I had that dream was about 1978. The following year, I wrote my first book, a little booklet on the, tw the ten virgins. I'd been studying that. And, and by 1979, I had concluded that what awakens the virgins who have all gone to sleep, like some of you are right now, <laughs> what awakens the virgins are the judgments of God. There's a startling event. There's a startling sequence. There's a startling crisis that suddenly unfolds. And suddenly they're awakened to realize, ooh, this is serious. Then I got to thinking, what could these judgments be? What would, what would awaken? And back in those days, I was thinking about God's people being all over the world. So what is going to simultaneously awaken God's saints that are all over the world, all at the same time? Remember, Matthew 25 was not written for a local setting. It's a global story. Judgments. I began looking for the judgments. And I concluded that these four angels have been holding back until their time of wrath comes. So there must be, in, in prophecy, there must be some explanation for the time of wrath. And where is it? Well, after I figured out what the trumpets were, and I believed that the fifth trumpet, early on, this, this, this made perfect sense to me, this was the physical appearing of Lucifer masquerading as God. Because he's released from the abyss, and he's the angel king with the name in Hebrew and in Greek, which means the identically the same thing, whether you're Jew or Gentile. It means the destroyer. All right. At that time, I had already come to conclude that when the full cup principle is reached, God releases a destroyer. Do you see the connection? Look at it. The 144,000 will proclaim the gospel of Jesus for 12... For about 890 days, as I understand it. And then the fifth trumpet occurs, and Lucifer is released for the last third, 445 days, of the Great Tribulation. Here's two thirds, here's one third. You know, 1,335 days is evenly divisible by three, 445 days each, each third. So, if God holds the devil back and spares the world of these final three trumpets, he spares us two-thirds and we have to put up with it for one-third. The devil and his angels will be ministering on earth for about a year and a few months, 445 days, if, that's, if that is correct. 
The reason that I suspect this is that 12 times, 12 repetitions, God repeated himself 12 times in the seven trumpets, showing and discussing one third. One third of the earth is burned up. One third of the trees were burned up. A third of the ships were sunk. A third of the sea creatures died. A third of the light disappeared. A third of the night disappeared. And I began looking, man, 12 times. What is he saying here? What is this about? Well, let me show you this. I, I began looking around for thirds, and I, uh, let's see, was it 1 Samuel? No, it's 2 Samuel. I never can remember that. There's a story in the Bible where the Moabites had refused to pay, pay tax. They had a little IRS problem uh, in David's day, like we're having right now. <laughs> And the Moabites, a tribal nation within the territory and the perimeter of David's uh, kingdom, the Moabites refused to pay tax. And, of course, that was treason. And so David went down with his army to take on the Moabites, and he conquered them. Now, watch what happens. David, being a very smart man, David also defeated the Moabites. He made them lie down on the ground, and he measured them off with a length of cord. Every two lengths of them were put to death, and the third length was allowed to live. I like this last sentence. So the Moabites who were spared had a little change of attitude and paid their taxes. <laughs> But David accomplished two things. By keeping the Moabites alive, he would still continue to get tax revenue for his kingdom because the attitude of the survivors would be changed. Does that make sense to you? Let me show you now a parallel. And I want to show you how David, who is a man after God's own heart, uh, it does exactly what God later did with Israel. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 10, 11. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, speaking now to Israel, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your vile images and detestable practices, I myself will withdraw my favor. I will not look on you with pity or spare you. Now, notice what Jesus does. This is the sovereign Lord, Jesus, we're talking about. A third of your people will die of the plague or perish by famine inside you. See, there's two of his four judgments. A third of you will fall by the sword outside your walls. Notice that his three judgments kill two-thirds of the people. And then the surviving third I will scatter to the winds and pursue, scatter from Jerusalem. And then my anger will cease and my wrath against them will subside. Okay. A lot of Christians don't like the Old Testament because it has a grouchy God. That's what they tell me. I, I run into this every day. People think the God of the Old Testament is grouchy. But they don't realize that the God they're talking about <laughs> is the same God who sat with the woman at the well. How do you reconcile such an extremity? Well, Jesus came to reveal the Father and that was his main mission as a man, 
in his efforts to fulfill the recipe required of salvation. So Jesus is in this mode, if you will, as the Savior. But in, he's in this mode as the King of Kings at, uh, in the Old Testament. And he's managing a group of rebellious people. So that we might see the, 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 the width of God's love. God's love is boundless. God's grace is amazing. But you know, God doesn't have one ounce of mercy for defiance. We can look at what happened to Lucifer in heaven. We can look at what happened to one-third of the angels. We can look at what happened to Adam and Eve. We can look at what happened at the flood. We can look at Sodom and Gomorrah. We can look at the destruction of Jerusalem. And we can look at the destruction, the upcoming destruction of the world, if you're brave enough to do so. So... What's the one-third all about? God spares. One-third destroys two-thirds. That's a generous God. That was a generous King David. But wait. The seven trumpets are just the opposite. God only destroys one-third and spares two-thirds. He would be justified in destroying two-thirds. But he chooses to only destroy one-third and spare two. And that's why I say, the physical appearing of the devil, who comes as a destroyer, who comes, this will kill you, he comes as God's servant. Boy, that really makes people nervous. Did God use Nebuchadnezzar? Did God use Cyrus? Yes, and for what purposes? Did God use Alexander the Great? Did God, let me ask you this, and you don't have to answer, but just the thought question, did God use Hitler? Did God use Napoleon? Did God use Pol Pot in Cambodia? Did God use Stalin? My view of history, taken from the Bible, is that when a body of people become incorrigible, God raises up a destroyer to accomplish his purposes. And it makes no sense from our point of view, humanly speaking. But it makes all the sense in the world from the divine point of view because God has to manage the population of this earth and its growth and development and its sin burden until the time comes for it to all blow apart and to be taken down. Am I making any sense? I know it's not a popular way to present the, the, the gospel, but this is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He raises up a destroyer when people become defiant. This is why a destroyer is released from the abyss at the appointed time. And the Bible says that he will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. Look at the Bible. Oops. I'll get, I'll, I'll get the, the verse up here for you to consider. Speaking about Lucifer, Daniel 11.36. The devil will come masquerading as Almighty God, and he will declare himself King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's got all authority, and he's got a hundred million angels with him to back him up. What do you say to a 15-foot angel who has a hundred million angels standing around him? Yes, sir. If you want to live long, Lucifer will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god. He's going to be greater than Mohammed. 
He'll be greater than Allah. He'll be greater than Jehovah to the Jews. He'll be greater than all gods, even Jesus Christ. The devil doesn't come masquerading to be Jesus Christ. If that were the case, he would only appeal to 25% of the world's population. The devil comes claiming to be Almighty God. And 2 Thessalonians 2 tells us very clearly the man of sin is opposed to all that is called God. So that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. And he, and, he, he, and he writes off all the religions of the world as though they're nothing. He has to because of our religious diversity. He levels the playing field by abolishing them all. I wrote a wake-up report just on that. Why the, God permits the devil to eliminate the religions and the nations, the governments of the nations, when he appears in the fifth trumpet. God wants him to abolish everything that man is made so that there will be no impediment for those willing to be saved. The reason a lot of people will reject the gospel as presented by the 144,000 is because they can't give up their old time religion. My old time religion is my God. I can't let go of my God. I worship my old time religion, you know, the religion that was once delivered to the saints. I can't let go of that. Man, I've been in here four generations. I can't let go of that. <laughs> I got news for you. Your religion is meaningless when it comes to salvation. Your faith in Jesus is meaningful. The devil is going to abolish Catholicism. He's going to abolish Hinduism. There's going to be one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And guess who's going to be God? What, does, what did Lucifer, why was he kicked out of heaven in the first place? What did he want? I want the highest chair. And so we call it today the high chair. <laughs> I was just seeing if you were awake. I'm, I'm just, I know, I know. I don't have much time here. Okay, so the devil is going to exalt and magnify, magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be, the devil will be successful for how long? Until the time of wrath is completed. And I like this last phrase. For what has been determined must take place. God has ordained it. God has ordained it. So the devil physically appears. Now, one thing that I'd like to point out, this chart, incidentally, is on pages you know, 4 and 5 in your book, Jesus' Final Victory. And the way... I've drawn this chart, prophecy 1, prophecy 2, prophecy 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And so we're looking at time going from left to right, and we're looking at each of the prophecies given all 17 of them until we end right up here with a new heaven and new earth. So you're looking at a wedding cake. Wedding cake? All right, all right. <laughs> and the layers of each prophecy stack on top of each other, and the toothpicks that hold the layers together are the events that align. And to make it simple, I, stole, I show that there are seven alignments between Daniel and Revelation, and that's what the green arrow box and the triangle box and the yellow, they indicate like, here's the first alignment, here's the second, and the second alignment, see, is the 1260 years of persecution mentioned in Daniel and in Revelation. Daniel and Revelation. So I'm trying to show in a simple little chart how God put the bones in Daniel, buried them for 26 centuries until the time of the end should come. The appointed time of the end. 
believe it or not, like it or not, we're at the time of the end. The book of Daniel, the rules that govern apocalyptic interpretation have been exposed. We know what they are. And this enables what is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then to make this, because most of the people of earth will not hear this, you are a very special group. Most of the people of the earth will not give this two seconds of consideration. This is too weird. This is too far out. This is too crazy. And you can speak till you're unspeakable. You have die of laryngitis. But most people of the earth will not bear to hear it. Their ears are plugged. They're, they have eyes, but can't see. They have ears, but can't hear. But buddy, they're in church every week. Makes you wonder why. But God, at the appointed time, Jesus at the appointed time, I use the term of God and Jesus uh, interchangeably because it's my conviction and my experience that the one on the throne right now is the, is the God we call Jesus. See, I believe in 1798, the Father took a sabbatical. He gave everything over to Jesus, and Jesus is, a, is in control, as the recipe requires, to bring the sin problem to a conclusion. So the Father is, on, is, is sitting there so, beside the throne, watching Jesus carry out the plan which Jesus promised to do, even though it's contrary to his nature to kill a single person or anything he's created. Jesus loves every one of us. The Father loves every one of us the same. And it breaks his heart. It, it, it gives him indigestion beyond measure to have to destroy anyone. He's not willing that one should perish. But what's a loving God to do? He can't go on and on and on allowing the curse of sin to ruin the lives of his people. God hates suffering, sin, death, sorrow, pain, you name it. That any, everything the curse has brought, he hates. And it's, he's, he's moving as quickly as is possible to eliminate this curse from the universe. So at the appointed time, because no one will listen, because no one cares, because no one will, will consider what he has to say from his word, from his word, Jesus said, I've got to do what I have to do. And the censer will be cast down, and the fourth seal will be broken open. He's going to tear up the world. He's going to take away everyone's security. And you know, in a crisis, people suddenly get religious for some reason. In 9-11, when the Twin Towers came falling down, church attendance jumped by 65%. Two years later, it's back where it was. <laughs> Human nature. Human nature. It stinks. The carnal nature stinks. So God is about to rise up. Jesus is about to cast down the censer, indicating that his patience, his atonement for earth as a whole is completed. It's finished. It's over. And now the wrath of God begins. And we have authority contrasted. I want to close on this thought. Please give me your full attention for a moment. When Jesus casts down the censer, suddenly there's going to be a new Jesus in town. One unlike anything Christians have ever considered. The death of 1.75 billion people, the destruction of the earth, the, destru the burning up, you know, the asteroid impacts, and the volcanoes. And the crazy thing about this for the science types and the atheist types is that the order of events are carefully outlined in the book of Revelation, and there's no way of getting around it because it was written 2,000 years ago. The order of events cannot be disputed. 
This is not just violent nature jumping around and causing all kinds of goofy stuff. No. This is very clinically and very surgically laid out and where God's judgments come down are just as deliberate and purposeful as they can be. And so suddenly, and what awakens the virgins? The great awakening will be the first four trumpets. Of course, the global earthquake and the rumblings and flashes of lightning and peals of thunder, that will be, you might say, the, the introduction to what's about to happen. Wherever you are, you better get home. Because what's coming is a fatal blow to the earth. It can never recover. Contrary to what Al Gore and others may say, it will never recover. <laughs> this is an inconvenient truth. This is a fatal blow. Jesus, the revelation of the authority of Jesus Christ, who Muslims deny, who Hindus hate, is going to suddenly change. And what is going to be seen all around the world in every country, every language, every people, every tribe, everybody is going to get a dose of the authority of Jesus Christ. Things are about to change. Tomorrow is unlike anything we have ever seen. And this is why we need the Bible. And this is why God gave us this information. He buried it for the final generation because the final generation is the only generation that needs it. And we do need it. Desperately. So the authority of Jesus happens under the first four trumpets. Then we get to, and then the gospel stalls out. The 144,000 are out there preaching every day, calling people to repentance, calling people to worship the Creator, to give their hearts and lives to Him and worship Him and come out of Babylon and be no part of that. But by 890 days, the whole thing, the, the, the 144,000 have about carried this as far as they can because everybody's made his decision generally speaking. And so when the gospel stalls, two-thirds of the time, the Lord releases a game changer, the devil, masquerading as Almighty God. And now, if you would not accept the authority of the Creator, you will accept the authority of a demon. Earthlings, you have a choice. Whom will you worship? The creator, by faith, or a demon, by sight. Would you stand for the benediction? Lord Jesus, what a story. What a powerful story. And through it all, we see your divine endeavor to save to the utmost. Even with a demon controlling and overruling the earth, you will use that lemon to make lemonade and you will save to the utmost those who wake up at the last minute and receive you as their Savior and Creator. It is so exciting to realize that you are a God of love. And you are a God of justice. You are fair. You are compassionate and long-suffering. And it is our great privilege and great pleasure to honor you in our hearts and in our lives by loving you and loving one another as you have commanded. Thank you for this time together this morning. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen.